And we are live. It's Dr. J here. Hope everyone's having a fabulous Friday. It's a little bit rainy here in Austin, Texas, but we could use the rain. It's been a hot summer and we're cruising into a really nice fall here. So excited for the weekend. Today I'm going to do a little FAQ action. So anyone that decides to pop any questions in on YouTube or Facebook, I'll be happy to answer them. So until the questions start rolling in, I'm going to just kind of rant um, a little bit here on a couple things. So off the bat, we talk a lot about blood sugar. We talk a lot about insulin resistance. And when it comes to that, there's a couple schools of thought. There's low carbohydrate is going to be better for insulin resistance because carbohydrates break down to glucose. Glucose and or fructose can stimulate insulin production, right? So you have this whole glucose, insulin, the receptor site gets numb to insulin and down regulates. And that's the whole philosophy kind of insulin resistance. That's number one. And then there's the whole idea, well, you have to cut the calories down to solve insulin resistance. That's kind of the whole idea, right? So lower calorie will equal less insulin because insulin does secrete with food and calories anyway. But we know that insulin is relatively neutral with fat, a little bit with protein because protein can be converted to sugar. And we do know that carbohydrates are the primary source of insulin. That's the reason why people measure blood sugar when they're trying to assess diabetes, right? 126 mg per DL is kind of that marker for diabetes. 110 mg per DL is that marker for prediabetes. So we know that carbohydrate thus going to glucose creates an issue. Now, my concern is this. People were talking about how ketogenic diets and gluconeogenesis can drive insulin resistance. My biggest bugaboo is this that if you look at a lot of the feedback loops, there was a new study that came out in the Journal of Molecular Biology this week, and I think that they talked about these cells, these receptor sites in the brain called teratocytes or teranocytes. I'll clarify, I'll do a video later on it. But these terato or teranocytes, they have, um, they get plugged into with a lot of the amino acids in healthy fats, meats, avocados, and nuts. So the real interesting component is the, these amino acids that are in these types of foods hit these tyranno or teratocyte receptor sites in the brain and they signal satiation. So my thing is this, if you eat foods that have a strong uh, satiation feedback loop, your chance of overeating is going to be less. So people talk about calories in, calories out. My thing is eat foods that tell your body you are satiated. Do it in a way where you're doing it three or four times a day or maybe you know two or three times a day. Or if you um, are going to do some intermittent fasting, you can always do it that way as well. So again, we want to eat foods that have very strong satiation receptors in the brain that tell us that we are full. Now, again, is it possible to overeat? Yeah, it's possible to overeat. It's, it still is. But for the most part, as long as you're not adding in excess carbohydrate, and when we say excess carbohydrate, we tier carbohydrate. There's refined sugar. Refined sugar could be alcohol. It could be just refined sugar in sodas or junk food, Pop-Tarts, those things. We have refined flours. May not be sugar, but it will break down to sugar. And we say sugar, it's like glucose, fructose in the body refined flours, right? Then we have carbohydrates that are starchy, right? And then in the starchy carbohydrate world, we have what's called the glycemic index or the glycemic load, which is how fast these carbohydrates get into your bloodstream. So for instance, white rice gets into your bloodstream pretty fast, higher glycemic index or load. Sweet potato, a little bit lower. White potato in between. So again, you got to keep in mind how fast these carbohydrates go in. Now, as soon as you add that kind of carbohydrate with a little bit of fat and protein, that lowers everything. It's called the glycemic load. So you got to be careful because if you're doing a lot of carbohydrates with a lot of fats consistently, when there's high insulin in the presence of lots of fats, that's not a good recipe. So in general, if you're going to be lower carb and higher fat, you know, I'd say 80 to 90% of the time, you don't want to do it in the presence of a lot of uh, carbohydrate because it's going to really jack up your body's ability to store fat even more. So I get some questions here coming in. So let's kind of rock it out here. Hope that makes sense. All right. So we got here, uh, feeling tired, fatigued with bulletproof coffee and collagen protein, 30 grams while fasting until 2 p.m. How to fix while still having the benefits of mTOR. Well, I got some bulletproof coffee and collagen here right now. I'll take a sip of it. Cheers to you guys. Happy Friday. Um, regarding feeling fatigued, so number one, I would say 
do you not feel fatigued if you actually had a solid breakfast? If you ate a really good meal, maybe some eggs and bacon, it could just be leftover, you know, chicken and asparagus from the night before, whatever. Do you feel better with a full meal? If the answer is yes, then I would say you, maybe you need a little bit more solid food in your diet in the morning. Number two, there just could be adrenal issues. There could be underlying adrenal, metabolic issues, mitochondrial issues, thyroid issues, and I would work on those things first. And also, you know, how did you sleep the night before? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting to bed on time? So those are the low-hanging fruit I would look at first. Let's see here. Uh, do blenders, i.e. the Vitamix, destroy enzymes and rancidify oils as making nut butters? Again, the nuts oils will be, they'll be like, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fatty acids. So they aren't going to be a super strong, you know, let me give you a kind of organic chemistry one-on-one with fats. So typically you have single bonds between all the carbons and these single bonds make the fat really stable. So a carbon can hold four hydrogens attached to it. So when that carbon has four hydrogens, it's considered to be saturated. And the more carbons that you link up with single bonds, so it's carbon, three fatty acids, carbon, two fatty acids, carbon, two fatty acids. That carbon is saturated. It's got four bonds. Now, that changes. When you start doing double bond between the carbons, now there's only one hydrogen between each carbon link. So now it's a carbon, double bond, carbon, one hydrogen, all right? Or it'll be carbon, double bond, carbon, double bond, right? Depending on how that fatty acid is structured. So when there's more double bonds between carbons, this makes it unsaturated. And if there are many, it's polyunsaturated, right? So saturated fats have all of their hydrogen bonds that are saturated, which makes them more stable at a higher temperature. The more double bonds they are, right, it becomes a monounsaturated, which is like olive oil or oleic acid, or polyunsaturated, which are many double bonds. And the more double bonds you have, the more that fat can rancidify. That's the kind of moral of the story. Regarding a Vitamix, I don't think you're going to get it up to a temperature hot enough um, to destroy um, or rancidify the fat. I mean, you got to get it at least into the 300 degree range. I don't think you're going to be able to do that with a Vitamix or at least long enough. So I wouldn't worry about it. And destroying enzymes, I wouldn't worry about that either. I'll see here. Uh, talk about using HCL for GERD and, and what works great with meals. What do you think happens with nighttime reflux? So number one, HCL with GERD, you got to be careful. So if you have a lot of acid reflux, typically we separate the enzymes and the HCL out. Okay, the reason why is people that have chronic GERD will have um, atrophic gastritis or they'll have just a thinning of the gut lining. So imagine someone that, you know, you want to get a massage, right? Who doesn't love massages? But now you got a sunburn. Well, even though that massage is good for you and therapeutic, the su you know, with the sunburn, you're going to be oversensitive to it, not going to enjoy it. Well, it's the same thing with hydrochloric acid. With that thinner gut lining, you may not be able to handle that much of it. So we separate the HCL and the enzymes out. We dial in the enzymes. We really ratchet it up. It tends to be less abrasive. We come in there with a very, very small amount of HCL. We may even do no HCL to begin with. We may just come in with a little bit of apple cider vinegar or a little bit of lemon juice, right? Or a little bit of Swedish bitters like gentian or ginger or anise or chamomile. And we may just taper that up just a little bit. And then if you can tolerate that, we may add in an eighth of a capsule of HCL or a little bit of apple cider vinegar. And then we just taper up from there. And we do it in the middle of the meal. Why? Because there's a little, little bit of food already lining the gut, lining the bottom of the gut. And there's also, also we're going to be eating afterwards, which will prevent it from hitting the esophagus. So that's kind of the best way to do it. And then you got to work up from there, heal the gut lining, get rid of the infections, H. pylori, dysbiosis, parasites. Hope that one helps. Uh, let's see here. Um, are you doing keto? For the most part, I'll do keto during the day. So like Bulletproof or butter coffee, collagen peptides. Lunch will be some kind of meat with uh, extra fat added and vegetables. Like today I'm going to do um, some kind of meat. I got some broccoli or I got some uh, Brussels sprout mix ready to go. Maybe a little kale salad, maybe a handful of berries. And at nighttime, I may have a little bit more starch at night, a tiny bit. So I try to keep, you know, the fast going. So if I'm, you know, you're sleeping eight hours, right? You got a fast going on. I'm already kind of waking up with a little bit of ketosis happening. I'm trying to keep that rolling for at least the next eight hours after I wake. So I'm just trying to get in, into and stay in that fat burning mode. Let's see here. Um, bulletproof diet, feel better when eating in the AM instead of fasting. So I would just listen to your body and just eat more. 
I would just eat more like solid food in the AM and you could still eat and still have some bulletproof coffee. So I would just um, eat, have a good meal and then have a little bit of bulletproof coffee afterwards. I have no problem with that. Um, see here, talking about here, keto had to buy electrolyte drops. You lose lots of water on keto, so that might be why you have fatigue. Yeah, so when you are dropping insulin, one thing that does happen is insulin, so glucose, let me get this right here, glucose stimulates insulin. Insulin, one more time, back it up. Insulin is going to basically help glucose get into the cell. What, what follows glucose is typically sodium. What follows sodium is water. So when you lower insulin, Typically, you're doing that by cutting down the carbohydrate. When the carbohydrates cut down, the sodium starts to get peed out a little bit more, and then also the water tends to go with that. That's why people lose so much weight off the bat on a ketogenic diet. Not necessarily fat, it's more just the water going out. For every one gram of glucose that comes in, three grams of H2O come behind it. So just keep that in mind. So that's why all my patients do a half a teaspoon of high quality real salt twice a day at least. And I recommend salting all your food liberally. And if you need a good quality electrolyte supplement on top of that, that's totally fine too. The healthy adrenals do all I need to do is cut out caffeine all day. No, you don't. So typically, you know, one to two cups of coffee in the morning is not going to be a make it or break it for your adrenals, in my opinion. You definitely don't want to do any coffee after the noontime hour. Caffeine's got a half-life of eight hours, right? So it's going to stick around in your body. If you have it, you know, around eight o'clock, it'll pretty much be out of your body within 12 hours. So it's not going to affect your sleep. So if you have it by eight, nine, or 10, it's going to be out of your body by the time you go to bed. Now, if you do it afternoon time, there's a good chance that it could be still lingering in your body. Now, also adding fat to the coffee binds up that caffeine and kind of time releases it. So you don't get it all at once. It's not like a whip, right? It's not going to whip you into effect. You'll have a nice kind of time release kind of magic carpet caffeine ride and it will gently go into your system. So you don't get that buzz and it actually, you know, takes um, a lot of the coffee and makes it more nutritive because there's a lot of good nutrients in the coffee. And if you can bind up that caffeine and time release it, I think it's great. And if you can throw some amino acids in there, even better, because if you get a little bit of coffee and a little bit of caffeine going, you know, my biggest concern is that you're creating a cortisol, maybe you're bumping up your cortisol a little bit, and we don't want that cortisol to go after your muscles and try to mobilize amino acids for gluconeogenesis, but if the body's got some amino acids in the bloodstream, it's going to go after that first. Why is it going to go and try to rip up muscle tissue when it's got amino acids sitting there right in the bloodstream. So I love the idea of having a little bit of aminos in the coffee via collagen and time releasing the caffeine. And one or two is fine and just don't do it after let's say 11 o'clock. That way it won't affect your sleep. But if you're constantly needing it or if you don't get your coffee or if you don't get those you know, one or two in the afternoon, one or two at the end of the day, then there's probably some adrenal dysfunction going on and you have to fix that. And, and you may need to do a, a decaf version for a while if, if it's really causing problems. Uh, Epstein bar potentially. Yeah. Should you worry about an Epstein bar infection? Um, yeah, potentially. I mean, you'd want to fix all the other things first, the adrenals, the thyroid, gut, get your diet in, get your sleep in, and you may want to address that as well. But typically it's not something I just go after first. We worry about all of the foundational stuff first. What do you think about sucralose? Sucralose is AKA Splenda. It's in all my BCAs, protein, et cetera. So number one, I have a BCAA product that's sweetened with stevia. So I recommend looking at that one, BCAA Synergy in my store, justinhealth.com shop. I formulated it that way because there's a lot of Splenda in those products. Number two, um, Splenda is nothing more than um, a sugar molecule with a bunch of chlorines attached to it. And the biggest issue with Splenda, studied by Duke University, it affects your microbiome. So my opinion, you do not want to be using Splenda. It's going to affect your gut, increase your chance of dysbiosis, lower your good bacteria. Uh, try to use a healthy, you know, birch, birch bark, xylitol option, or do a stevia option. Make sure it's not corn based and there's no maltodextrin added. Any specific recommendations for adrenal fatigue sufferers? Yeah, go check out my podcast on adrenal fatigue. Check out my videos on adrenal fatigue. Go to justinhealth.com, hit the search button, and just punch in that word, and you'll get tons and tons of resources. Are split lentils pretty easy to digest? Almost paleo friendly compared to grains, not the legumes. So, number one, it depends. Are they soaked? If you're soaking them, that's much, much better. 
Okay. Number two, if you eat them, how do you feel? Do you get bloated or gassy? A lot of people have a hard time breaking them down. The soaking helps. That's why so much of the Beano is sold over the counter at a lot of these stores. Beano is nothing more than an enzyme to help break it down. So if you can break it down, it may be something you add in there every now and then. Maybe it's part of that 20%. I don't think it's a big deal for most people. As long as your health is under control, I'm totally fine with it. Just make sure you can actually break it down and it's not making you bloated or gassy. How long to notice positive effects from your thyroid balance due to low thyroid? Uh, it depends. So if you have lower thyroid hormone levels, you know, we would taper that in typically one capsule and then every one to two weeks, add one capsule on there, taking it 30 minutes before food. If any nausea occurs, it typically happens 15 to 20 minutes after and you just eat a little bit sooner. Uh, again, it depends. So we'd want to retest and make sure your thyroid hormone levels are optimal. You know, TSH is back in range. Uh, but more importantly, looking at your T4 and T3 conversion and making sure your T3 levels are also at a good uh, kick too. Um, but typically, you should notice it a few weeks to a month if we get it dialed in. Absolutely. Can someone on metformin and insulin shots for a year start a ketogenic diet all of a sudden? If yes, ketogenic diet is to be followed with insulin shots. So regarding insulin, if you have, imagine this person, they could either be type 2 diabetic or type 1. I'm not sure. It could be a long progressed type 2 person that's now needing insulin or it could be a type 1. So typically, I would give the least amount of insulin to get your blood sugar back into range. As you start becoming more insulin sensitive because you're relying more on ketones, then sugar or glucose for fuel, you're going to need less insulin to unlock the cell to get glucose inside. So the goal is to use the absolute least amount to make that happen. So most people have some kind of like long-acting insulin that they're taking to start their day or to end their day. And then they're taking typically short-acting insulin during the day, like a Lantus or something like that, some kind of... um short acting insulin. So the goal is number one, you know, you work with your endocrinologist or wherever your conventional doctor is on this and you let them know that you're shifting your diet. The biggest issue that starts to happen is if you keep your insulin the same and you start making these diet changes to make your receptor sites more sensitive and lower the sugar, what's going to happen is your blood sugar may start to drop and you may, may start going more hypoglycemic. So you want to start looking for hypoglycemia. You want to start testing your sugars throughout the day. Uh, you know, fasting one, two, three hours after a meal, see how you're doing and you want to start adjusting it. So you figure out what your insulin, what your unit of insulin ratio per carbohydrate is. It could be four, it could be six, maybe it's one unit per six carbs or six grams of carbohydrate. So you would just keep on, you know, increasing it. So maybe it's one unit per eight, one unit per 10, one unit per 12, and you would just gradually increase that, but you want to do it with your endocrinologist on board and you want to be measuring because you don't want to go um, you don't want to give yourself too little insulin and then your blood sugar is hanging out really high. But also, if you keep it where it's at and you change your diet, you're going to go low, which is not going to be a good thing either. So you just got to measure and keep an eye on it. Assess and test. Let's see here. Um, is mild intermittent fasting 12 to 16 hours, five days in a row bad for low thyroid? If you already have thyroid function or adrenal issues or any type of mood or issues, I don't recommend any intermittent fasting until you get more stabilized. You can just make sure you're getting enough high quality protein, eating good during the day. And then once you get more stable, then you can give it a try one day a week to start and you can try on a non-stress day. Again, when you're more stressed you are, the more nutrition your body needs. So fasting isn't going to be the best on a stress day because you're, you're avoiding those nutrients. We want to make sure we flood the body with the nutrients it needs, especially on the stress days. And then do a fasting maybe once a week once you're more stable on a day that has less stress. Thoughts on tinnitus? Any idea how this can arise after stress? Perhaps changes in certain brain networks? Well, tinnitus has a lot of autoimmune connection. So tinnitus is like ear ringing. So if you have a lot of tinnitus, there's a strong autoimmune connection with that. So number one, get on the autoimmune diet. Number two, there's a strong connection with Hashimoto's and thyroid issues. So get yourself looked at for thyroid. Get yourself um, looked at for any other autoimmune issues. And again, if there's an autoimmune connection, guess where to start? You got to look at the gut and you want to look at obviously the hormones too and make sure those are all supported. Get the inflammation down. That's a really good starting point though. Any suggestions to replace electrolytes and minerals after I use a near-infrared sauna? 
was thinking about coconut water, but it's high in sugar. Yeah, so when you're doing saunas, uh, you can do like a really good, um, like real salt. Real salt's great because Red, Redmond's real salt, they got really good minerals in there and you can put it in your water, drink it before, and you can even put some in your water bottle and just sip it while you're in the sauna. That's a really good solution right there. And if you do an exercise where you're doing a lot of workout and you're lifting and you're depleting your glycogen and lifting weights during you know, during a session or right after a session, maybe you, you lift and then do sauna and then afterwards, I have no problem adding some coconut water, especially if it's post-workout because it, it is very high in potassium. That is true. I've been struggling with dizziness for eight months now. I feel spaced out. I'm exhausted every day as well. Any recommendations on the dizziness? I've been working on the cervical fascia, but it doesn't work. So if you're dizzy, I mean, I would typically look at minerals and I would typically look at blood sugar and I would typically look at adrenals. So you really want to get the adrenal supported, add in the minerals, make sure you're not going more than five hours without eating, especially if like you're changing positions, if you're bending over and then you stand up fast and you get dizzy or if you bend down and stand up, you get dizzy. It's definitely an orthostatic hypotension thing where you're just not able to perfuse, you're not able to perfuse blood to the brain fast enough and that's why that dizziness occurs. So get the minerals up, start supporting the adrenals. They want to get tested so you can see where you're at. Let's see here. Um, electrolyte drops, add your water. I had to do it when I started getting headaches after keto. Yep, add extra minerals in there. When your insulin drops, your, so your glucose and your sodium drops, and that can potentially cause that for sure. Let's see here. Is cacao powder high in caffeine? Hold on one sec here. Let's see here. Make sure I got this going. Okay. Is cacao powder high in caffeine? I was going to add it in my post-workout shake late morning, but my adrenals are bad. Right now, should I do something else? Um, yeah, I mean, cacao powder, if it's a good quality cacao powder, I have no problem adding it to your shake. I would just see how you feel. If, if your heart's kind of going out of control, you have some heart palpitations, you're more anxious, then I would avoid it. But I'm okay with a little bit of cacao powder, and there's a lot of nutrition in there. So I would just make sure you feel okay afterwards. And as long as you do, I have no problem with that. All right, does the nightshade inflammatory nature of chili peppers get – overpowered by the antioxidant properties? It's a great question. So typically I would always recommend people or patients coming off all nightshades altogether just because of the potential alpha solanines that are in there that can be really inflammatory in the joints. So the question is, are you, is the antioxidants overpowering maybe the irritation from the alpha solanines? So I would cut it out and then reintroduce it back in and see how you do. And I would do one nightshade at a time. And also keep in mind, it could be the nightshade load. So if you do a meal where you're having a whole bunch of um, white potatoes and maybe some eggplant and peppers and tomatoes all at the same time, that may be too much. So you gotta keep in mind the load component, go off it, get it out of your system. So when you add it in, you're working with a clean slate and you know if it's a problem or not. All right, always wake up in the middle of the night, 3 to 5 a.m. to urinate, leading to uh, poor quality of sleep. How to sleep deeply through the night without waking up. Uh, I reduce liquids before bedtime. Great. So number one, it could be a blood sugar issue. All right, so I would make sure you're having a little something within one to two hours. Um, number two, if you need, you can always do a little bit of coconut oil, maybe a tablespoon and a teaspoon of honey right before bed just to give yourself a little bit of support. If that helps, it's probably a blood sugar issue. You can also make a little shake and put it right by your nightstand. So if you do get up, you can have a little sip of it. And again, the question is how long you're up for. If you're up for just a few minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, not a big deal. Maybe you just have a little shake next to your bed, you hit it, and then you're good. If you're up a lot longer, then I would maybe have a little bit of sublingual melatonin right by your bed as well, or a little bit of GABA, and you can spray it or put it in your mouth just to get you back there. If you follow those strategies, you should be pretty good. The dizziness is constant throughout the day. It doesn't have to do with moving around or standing up. Well, I would look at, number one, make sure there's not a, a benign positional proximal vertigo, BPPV. So you want to make sure there's no otolith crystals in your cochlea. So you'd want to get assessed by a really good um, functional neurologist chiropractor to make sure that is the case and they can help clear those crystals out. If it's not a structural thing with the crystals in the cochlea or the vestibular tubes, then I would look at just getting all the diet and blood sugar stuff dialed in. And you can also add in some ginger too, which can be really helpful for um, those kind of symptoms as well. But I would look there first and get the minerals going too. 
I had the same issue with several gut infections and convinced that caused it. Get your gut checked. My dizziness, anxiety are gone. Took some time to heal, but so worth it. Yeah, 100%, Sam, you're right on point. Uh, the gut is going to throw off minerals and electrolytes, and it's going to create adrenal issues because when the adrenals are weak, it's hard to hold on to minerals. It's hard to absorb and break down nutrients and minerals in the food, so get that looked at too. Make sure the diet is dialed in too. How to increase testosterone if it's low, male and early 30s. So number one, make sure your adrenals are doing good. Number two, make sure you're eating a lot of really good selenium and zinc rich foods. Okay, a lot of those are gonna be based on healthy animal products. Um, make sure you're getting enough amino acids. Make sure you're stimulating the muscles. Make sure you're getting um, some resistance training going. That's gonna be super helpful. That'll stimulate the muscles. The muscles will then stimulate testosterone. All right, hope that helps, but that's an easy thing off the bat. And then from there, there's various herbs you can use too to help stimulate it. You can do various tribulus, um, making sure there's adequate zinc. Supplementing zinc is great. Um, supplementing selenium, if you need it, can be excellent. And then you can also do um, various um, supplements, maybe DHEA or pregnenolone or Eleuthero or Adapogens to help stimulate that as well. See, I have intense cervical muscle pain. Did you have that? So yeah, I mean, anyone that's going to have chronic issues regarding the adrenals, pain can be an issue. So if you have the dizziness and the pain, well, when the adrenals are weaker, it's going to be hard to regulate inflammation. So having pain like that could be common. So look at the adrenals, look at the gut. Again, I sound like a broken record here, but if you have a, a major system dysfunction, you can't ignore it. You really have to make sure it's being assessed and addressed. All right, let's see here. Any other questions, comments, or concerns, guys? All right, I got a roll. I got a patient here. Oh, one last question. Hold on, where did it go? What supplements can I use for anxiety and fear? I use L-taurine. Uh, should I use GABA when? So yeah, I mean, if it's throughout the day, you can use GABA. You can use a combination of ashwagandha. You can use magnesium. Uh, again, low-hanging fruit is making sure blood sugar is stabilized, um, making sure you're not going longer than five hours without eating those kind of things, and then fix the gut, fix the hormones. And um, if there's something deeper with the fear, you may want to use some NLP or EFT or EMDR techniques to get to the subconscious component of that. Hope that helps, guys. Everyone have an awesome weekend. I got a jet. You guys take care. Thanks.